Hello everyone. Uh, this is very, very strange, sending a talking to essentially a webcam. Uh, but this is a fair. I do a fair amount of this these days, actually, as I uh, live in Germany, but end up working in Berlin. Berlin, and I'll be touching. No, so I live in Germany, end up working in the UK quite a lot. Um, in this talk, I'm just going to share a few links with you, because there's more content than I can possibly cover in the time I have available, and. Uh, I'm just going to give you a rough idea of my plan for here. So it's just been made, av made available in the general uh, chat in Slack that you have there. And I'm just going to start showing my screen with you in a second so you can see what I see. And I apologize if this runs a little bit fast because I tend to talk extremely quickly. And I try my best to kind of keep, uh, keep an eye on it, but sometimes it doesn't work out so well. So um, I've just had a nice introduction from Jen. And I could just keep, I'm going to share a few more links which should, which should give you some idea of like what I've been up to and what I tend to do. So I've been working in um, well, environmental tech startups uh, for a while. Uh, so we've been looking to solve problems like um, make trains as easy to book as planes uh, with a company called Loco2, which is listed on there. We've also been trying to work out the carbon footprint of everything uh, with a company called AMI, which stands for Avoid Mass Extinction Engine. And in the UK, I've been running a series of events called uh, Clean Web London. Uh, and then since moving to Berlin, I started running the same things. You can see a few links, a few examples of this of various people. And if you actually zoom into this, we can actually see this is one of the talks uh, from James Christie, who, uh, who organized this conference. He gave a talk at one of our um, meetups talk, telling us about environmental web design. So I'm just going to give you a rough idea of the plan for the next 40 minutes, because I would get bored of hearing myself speak for 40 minutes. So I'm hoping that we can have something which is slightly more, I guess, interactive, really. So I'm going to cover, if I, zoom out, if, I, if I zoom out for a second, you'll see that I've got a load of stick, of load of notes here, a load of images, and I was going to kind of talk through this uh, in various sections. So I was going to send, spend a, a, maybe about up to five minutes in each section, and then open up uh, a Google Doc where I'm inviting everyone else to add some questions. And if we have any questions, I'll answer them. And if not, then we can spend a bit more time looking through some of the links and some of the information that we have here. So uh, this is the rough plan. So I'll talk about the scale of the problem. I'll give some idea about why they're working out this is hard and what the existing methodologies, why it's often difficult. I'll have a go anyway to talk about it, and uh, then I'm going to talk about some of the steps that we can take uh, that hopefully you should be able to use. So without further ado, I've established the plan. Uh, let's see where we're going. So basically, the scale of the problem, at the moment, the internet, or actually IT, is around between two and a half and three percent of uh, planetary emissions, and the of the 830 million ton figure, which is the most commonly used figure uh, that from the Smart 2020 report, about about 25 percent of that is seen as uh, data centers, uh, which is basically anything that, that you can think of that as uh, basically the things that we you know service, for example. Uh, another, I think, 15% of that is the networking is actually networking, but kind of shunts bits and things around. So we're looking at something like the same footprint as uh, the well, basically as aviation, but it's growing quite a bit faster. In fact, it's actually growing something in the region of, as more people start using the web, where like data centers in particular are growing at something like 40% year on year. Now, 40% sounds quite large, but when you realise that in 10 years, that's like 30 times the. Uh, it's it, over over 10 years. That's something like a 30 time, a 30 times uh, um, increase. It's it actually gets very very scary. And this is, I think, in a, a, we'll, from a, when we when, when we look through some of these figures, you'll see some absolutely terrifying stats. So in the next say, I think by in the next 10 years, it looks like uh, Japan. Uh, the the energy demands for data centers in Japan alone are currently out, will, are on track to outstrip basically Japan's entire energy production. So we have a bit of a problem coming uh, coming up ahead of us, and uh, this is partly why I've mentioned why, why I've shared some links here. Some of these are this one here in particular from the Independent. It gives you a bit of an idea about why this is such an alarming thing and why we might cover it. Uh, this one here is actually. Basically, an image is something from one of my kind of heroes, Brett Victor, who's been talking about 
uh, well, te technologists, people like us, and what we can do about climate change. If there's ever a half an hour or an hour reading anything about this, that is the by far the best thing to actually look at, and it's a really well kind of transformational uh, piece of transformational article. I really, really find it extremely interesting, and it's it, it's it's worth looking at and exploring uh, for the next few minutes actually. So I think that's these are the the, the things that I, I probably link to, and I'd and, I, and I'd open up now. I'm just going to see if we've got any questions now. So I'm going to come through from this. And uh, do we have at the moment the scale of the problem? Not yet. Oh, there's something from Jevons' paradox. So one of the ideas here is that, well, okay, so I've mentioned all these kind of terrifying figures, uh, but there's this idea that, well, okay, it's all right because everything we're, we're we're getting more efficient. You know, phones are getting smaller, computers are getting more power, more powerful for the same use of power, and things like that. And servers themselves are getting much more effective. Okay, that's my first set of five minutes down. And that is actually, it's not technically, it's, 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 it's actually a discussion which is often left out or kind of overlooked in lots of sustainability, uh, sustainability communications where people tend to talk about things like, um, we'll often, we'll, 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 we'll say, we'll, we'll talk about things like energy, uh, energy efficiency as being one of, the, one of the best ways to actually re re reduce emissions. The problem is that, it's actually known as another. It's known by another term, which is uh, the Kazum Brooks postulate, which is a fantastic term for basically the general idea that energy energy efficiency improvements they actually tend to have a kind of net increase uh, in energy usage um, in the absolute in, in the absolute sense. And uh, you could argue that this is one thing that's happening with uh, the move to cloud. So yes, we are replacing lots and lots of. Uh, we, we're replacing, say, data centers in certain places, but there is something of a rebound effect that we need to be aware of, and we sh should be having something of a conversation about it. It was initially from this idea of um, from uh, William Stanley Jevons. So William Stanley Jevons was uh, he saw this effect in coal in uh, the early two in in in, in England um, more than 150 years ago, when we were looking at it, when he where he discovered that. When steam engines got more more efficient, uh, it actually increased the amount of CO of smog generated, but uh, in, in the atmosphere because people started using them more. And this is essentially the same idea that's kind of being brought forward. So, I'm just going to see if there's anything back from this now. No, there's nothing here yet. But we do have an anonymous shrew and an anonymous fox looking here. So I imagine we might have something coming through. If not, I'm going to dash back. Uh, to the mural and see what else we can actually come through to talk, talk about on this. So there's another thing that we might want to think about in terms of the scale of this problem, which is to do with the amount of carbon that we have actually kind of locked in the ground and uh, how much carbon we are able to burn between now and well, basically in, if, if we want to stay within two degrees Celsius. And the reason I want to kind of point your attention to this is I haven't seen a better demonstration of this than this graph halfway through here. So I'm going to scroll down here to show you what I'm talking about. So when you get to this part here, this is the thing I'm going to um, I'm, I'll show you in particular. So I'm just going to wait a second because from memory, when you actually look at when you use Hangouts, there is a bit of a there is a bit of a lag before you can see anything. So let's assume we have we want to stay within two degrees. Now this example here lets us try to see how, get an idea of how much, how quickly emissions will have to be reduced in order for us to actually get through this. So even even, even, even when we're here, we are going to have to, we, we think that's a fairly precipitous drop of emissions if you see, what, see what's happening here. And we're still in trouble. So essentially, we will need to get to the point of 2035, have everything entirely that's that that this blue area under the graph is pretty much all we can really burn, and if you think about that, we're halfway. We're in 2016 now. We have essentially 15 years, which is absolutely staggering, and uh, is well. Hopefully, it's it's it's, it's it, it gives some kind of gravitas to what we're actually talking about here. So I'm going to zoom back out now, and uh, come back here. I really, really cannot recommend reading this enough. It's Absolutely inspiring, uh, inspiring piece. So that is pretty much one of uh, that, that. Hopefully, we should we we are starting to kind of set some of the scene here. 
Now, bear me for a second. I'm just going to see if, see if there's any questions that have come through here. No, we haven't. No, we haven't yet. So these articles are the ones which are probably the most used so far. Now, I'm just going to zoom out now and talk about why. So we've we've established that yes, this is something we, we care about, and we something I'm something we want to actually do something about. So. And uh, there is often the term that anything that can be measured can be managed. So we think, okay, so let's see if we can start working at the footprint of websites or the footprint of organisations. And uh, in previous jobs, that's something I was trying to do. So at Amy, we tried to work out the carbon footprint of everything by essentially collating all of the models uh, for which were known as emission factors for all of the kinds of processes that are listed in the IPCC reports or by DEFRA. DEFRA is a UK department which stands for the Department of Education, oh, no sorry not education, of oh, uh, farmland and rural affairs. So they're the people who actually track things like the, uh, the, the, the actual impact of things like agriculture and so on. And uh, you, we basically combined, we, 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 we collected all this stuff together, but I digress, I'm going, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself here. If you are going to try and work out the footprint of anything, the generally accepted way to do this, or one of the most common ways for companies that use to, to report their emissions, is something called the GHG protocol. And they have a notion of having different scopes of, of, uh, for emissions, so any single organisation they might uh, they they might count the emissions uh, their CO2 emissions in three ways. So scope one, which is direct, which is generally seen as you burning fuel yourself. Scope two, which is uh, electricity used uh, in that, that's generated for you, say like nuclear and things like that. And indirect scope three, this is the hard one, and that's essentially any kind of service or product that you buy. And now that's actually quite difficult to work out because. If in order for you to work out your own uh, the scope th your scope through you need to look at all of your suppliers and if you want uh, to get an idea of the total amount that they have uh, their total emissions so you can work out your scope three you need to work they need to work out their emissions so you end up this with a very 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 complex problem to work out this might feel a little bit academic so I'm just going to try and give you what I've used as a way to explain scope one two and three and how it's or how I th how I tend to think about it or explain it to other people. So the best way that I can think of is if I'm thinking of scope one, then I'm basically burning, let's say I'm burning a wood uh, air to heat, a, to heat a kettle to boil water so I can make tea. Scope two is me using an electric kettle to uh, make tea. So coal may be burned somewhere, but I'm benefiting from it and I'm running it uh, a kettle myself. And the third one might be me going to pret a manger or Starbucks and buying a cup of tea. So I have less and less insight into the emissions associated with these various scopes and this is it's already a challenge when you're a company like Facebook that owns all its own servers or you're on maybe a, an org, a university or you're, or you're a cab company where you have all this stuff to track yourself where, where you own everything and you run everything yourself but it gets even harder when you're thinking about organizations like um, Uber or Airbnb or other web-based companies where you don't really have this notion of organizational boundaries in the same sense. So we might think of something like Uber or Airbnb as a as a as a, as uh, the service that we use to ac access somewhere. But essentially, we have lots and lots of other entities. So try it for Airbnb or Uber to work these numbers out in a kind of comparable fashion to others is actually extremely difficult because you would have to coordinate every single other person to start working out the scope one and two, three numbers themselves. And uh, when we tried to do this, and uh, we burned through a fair amount of cash trying to work this stuff out when we were at Amy, we just had a really, really hard time doing it. So immediately we've got a very difficult, we're, we're, we're having trouble trying to actually make some sense of this. Uh, so it's not saying it's impossible, but it is very, very difficult. Uh, so there is something which is of, of use there, but there are some uh, issues with it which are somewhat problematic and I'm speaking about this so we can come back to this a little bit later on. So elsewhere, uh, another if, maybe there are other examples or other things that we can use to help us think about websites and, uh, the, and with the footprints of those. So one of these ideas is from construction. So in construction you have the embodied energy materials. So for example if you're building, a, if you're building something out of um, a structure out of aluminium then a lot of electricity has already been embodied into the materials. 
before you can actually do any before you've even decided what to do with it. And then there's a load of energy which goes into the building process of this. And then there's a kind of longer, kind of low level period where you have to kind of keep it warm, habitable, hot, lit, and so on. And we might think of this uh, when we're working out the footprint of stuff ourselves. So let's say we have embodied an energy in our tools from our laptops to servers, but possibly the or you can think of it possibly as, as the actual software itself, right? So if you have something like the Drupal project or WordPress that has had hours and hours and hours of people working on something, then there's a notion of embodied energy which may be worth exploring. Likewise, when you're building a website, yes, there is uh, the impact of, the, of, of running servers in places, but there's also the impact of travel and being in an office while you work on something. Uh, and then finally, there's this notion of well, keeping something online and usable. So that might be maintenance on a project, or in, in or, and uh, actually in addition to just running servers somewhere. So these are some ideas that we can we, we can apply when we're trying to think about what what the inputs are in, in in building a website or building any kind of like online service, and trying to work out the impact of that on an environmental sense. So I'm going to zoom out now to take us back to the next section. And I'm just going to go to trying to run through that. I'm going to run through some of this to give us an idea of where we might think about this. So what we have here is I basically had a bit of time with a friend of mine to kind of start sketching out and think how we, how we'd actually do this. And we kind of had this uh, idea where you'd start in an office. There's some there, there's something involved in actual hosting of something, and then there is uh, the, the there's also the use the, 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 that we need, need to be thinking about when we're actually building any kind of website. So I kind of started with this, and this is part of what we've got to be thinking about making the initial talk for James in the first place. And then what I, what I did is I kind of expanded that in a bit more detail. And I thought of it in terms of, well, there's discovery, there's design and build, there's hosting, and uh, there's use. So what I figured we might, might be able to do is think about some of the inputs along here, and then I'll point you to a few resources that I found useful uh, to look at this. Two seconds. Okay, nothing's coming from here. I'm just going to check if there's any questions from here. No, the scale of the problem. No, not at the moment. Okay, but we do have a funny looking cormorant. All right, so I'm going to move on for the next sec to the next section here. Ah, we've got some numbers here, so there's some some impact coming in here. All right, so I'm going to come back to this in a sec because I think this is going to be the meat of what we're talking about at the moment, but I'm glad that we've got some input from Anonymous Lima. So I'm hoping by doing this we can actually create something which is lost beyond just this conversation, uh, this 40-minute talk that we have. So I'm going to go back to where we, where we were before. And uh, yeah, so the steps that we have. I'm going to share with you a worked example. So James has actually put together a version of this himself. So. I'm just going to open this for you to see. I found this quite useful when James created this because it's it's basically the footprint of a UX designer working themselves. So you can see some examples here and you can see some basic assumptions and then as you scroll down here you can see the impact of this. So if you're buying some of this stuff here, uh, if you're in the office, some, something to do with commuting or buying computers, James has actually put together some numbers here to make some of this easier to work out so he's taken he's looked at kind of travel and things like that and conferences and you look at some of the numbers here and uh, well he arrives at figures of like something in the region of say 20 ton, 20 tons for people who actually work um, in UX and do a fair amount of travel and visiting clients and that wasn't a million miles away from the numbers that we've that we kind of worked out ourselves I actually I had a friend uh, I was working with a friend who helped me ex make sense of this um, Ed Murphy, who I've worked with on various other projects before. And um, I'm just going to share this for a second and let it open up. And what we did was we basically started, uh, what, what, what Ed um, did when he, when he talk, talked me through this was he, he started looking at some of this himself. So he was looking at the footprint of, I'm just going to need to move this so you can see that. This was a, a common project for a client who I'm not going to name, but if you think about some like the this was a project which was about I think 30 odd days of build and let's see if I can bring up the numbers actually see if they're of some use so let's say we've got a site which cost about say 20k to build 
and it was assumed to ex uh, assumed to last for about three years. And we've got maybe say 30 days working on the project to like build it, and then 30 days from the client side to be managing this and doing stuff with it. And if you think about, you've got maybe this many results, this many people visiting, and people are using it for say two and a half minutes, for example. I mean, I'm not going to run through all the, the all the stats here because I think a lot of it it's it's beyond the scope we have for 40 minutes, but we looked at some of this stuff here, and uh, there was a few other assumptions made here. So things like travel, for example. I'm just going to check for a second because I've had a, had a request come through, and I'm not sure if that's yes. Okay, cool. That's just encouragement. So this, uh, what we've got some numbers here are basically people working on the project whose name whose names have been changed. So we've we've travelled this far on the tube and bus and car, and like we can work out some idea of like the CO2 per day from this. And uh, there is a we've got some idea of like what these figures really are. So uh, like for, from a UK person's figure, so we've got an idea of what the footprint would actually be and how to compare that to other things. But I'm just going to jump straight ahead to something which is quite useful because when looking through this, one of the biggest surprises for us um, uh, when when Ed was taking me through this was actually showing me the fact that well this part here, this 26% is uh, the hosting part for a lot of websites. The big thing is actually using offices and people. So that's a that that's quite you know that's still a big thing. So why we why I can I'm going to talk about lots of parts of the internet. It's still it's still one thing to think about right now. However, if we look at say companies which have a larger scale than us, so let's say that you're building a website that gets very very popular. I'm just going to show the shape of uh, the of, of of Facebook for example. So let's say that you build something uh, that's serving. If you look at the numbers of say WhatsApp for example, so 56 engineers serving 40, 42 billion messages uh, per day. It looks a bit more like this, right? So tiny little bit of people, huge amount of the internet. And we're kind of heading in this direction. So while stuff for us, a lot of us, if we're agent if we're working on agencies and not so huge projects, we might have some kind of some some kind of shape here. On larger projects, the impact of the web web of the actual web itself becomes more and more important. So I think I've run through my next five minutes, so I'm just going to see uh, to open open up and see if there are any questions so far. So where are we? I've confused myself again, haven't I? Here we are. Yes. So can we re re relate kilobytes and megabytes to CO2? Tried. It's hard and out of date. Yes, I've had the exact same problem here. And just space to. Is there a way? Yes. The the closest thing I found for this one here is a question about additionality. And that's a idea which is used by lots of people who do offsetting. Uh, without going into too much detail, the general idea is that when people will inspect some kind of offsetting program, they will actually see if the if if construction would have gone ahead anyway, and uh, that's taken into account to decide if uh, if a carbon credit is well, basically should count or not, because you. The idea being that there are certain things that people will do anyway, like they will switch, say, light bulbs to be more efficient, for example. But if there are things which are not economically, uh, basically don't make sense economically, then they might they might not do it. And this is one example that's used by a UK provider called Memset, who I'm quite a big fan of, actually. Uh, they, they don't plant trees, or they haven't been planting trees recently, but the thing they do instead is... They were. They basically found a, a mine in the Ruhr region of Germany that was emitting lots and lots of CO2, and it wasn't actually. It wasn't economically viable to shut that off. So they, someone created kind of an instrument around this, so that it, so that people who would needed to offset the, the their emissions were able to basically plug this hole, so CO2 wasn't being kind of vomited into the into the atmosphere. So. I guess there is some there is some, something to look at there, but I'm afraid I don't have a real link. Uh, I don't have too many links at the moment, but I'm hoping someone might be able to share something for this because this concept of additionality is the closest thing I've seen so far. So I'm going to go back now and see what we have. So approved offsets. Yes, there's something I'm going to touch about in the mitigating steps that might be of some use to this. Uh, Basically, not all offsets are created equal, and I'm sure other people have some opinions to talk about this. But I'm just going to dash back to run through some of these extra steps because uh, that is something to talk about in the mitigating steps. So let's go back to where we were. So I think, yeah, this is where we were. So 
I've got some worked examples of uh, the of, of the impact of, uh, at this point here, and then I'm referring to a few things for you to actually explore in a bit more detail. So there's a mention that someone's mentioned WPO, which is Web Performance Optimization. So this question about kind of additionality and like uh, whether something will go ahead, that may be something that comes up further down the line. Uh, because a lot of um, organizations tend to use basically cost cuts to say we're being green because we've got really, really efficient servers or, or really efficient web pages. And there is, um, you're not, in most cases, you're not only doing this to make the world a better place, you're doing it because it's very, very good business sense. And uh, you can see some of this in some of this information, some of these kind of letters here. So this article about the website obesity crisis. This is probably the best call to action I've seen for people talking of increasing weight of pages. And if you look at some of these numbers here, there's something I've found which is quite useful. So this link here gives you some exact numbers, but if we just look at these, for example, you'll see some pretty you know, impressive stats, right? So where the actual footprint comes from. So even just five years ago, we might say that images would have typically been the largest use of power these days. And then uh, there's a fair amount of things like JavaScript, which is a big, which is the next largest thing. And then you've got things like HTML, style sheets, and so on. And over time, you'll see images get larger and larger and larger as we end up with big, full color splashes. But in the last year, you'll see this somewhat scarier thing coming in, which is video. And video is great for engagement. And you'll see things like um, Facebook and uh, uh, and Twitter these days now will autoplay videos. Uh, so you've got this immediate thing where people are using videos much more. And when you look at lots of websites, you'll typically see high bandwidth uh, uh, videos in the background, which just destroy which destroy any attempts that you're trying to have to make you uh, to, to have a kind of lightweight, fast loading page. So that's one thing that we might want to think about. So. I haven't really got much more of an exam example than, uh, than these ones here, but I'm my, my, my hope for this was to just have a conversation and see what comes out from everyone else because I, the great thing about having a, an online conference is it's a different media to being on stage and it's quite it's a lot easier to have some kind of conversation back and forth well that's the goal so that's partly why I'm sharing something which I hope you were able to explore and provide some com provide some comments and feedback and questions as you run through this so let's see that's what we have in it now I'm saving the best part or the biggest part for last, which is uh, this stuff here, all the way down here, because this is very much my kind of bread and butter, and there's probably a lot to talk about uh, the steps that you can take that are probably the most useful things for us at the moment. So I'm just going to dash into the other the other part to see if there's any any questions coming up. So we've got approved offsets that you brought up. Yeah, and there's a mention of EcoGrader as well, which is something I'm going to be talking about a little bit later on as well. So let's talk. Let's think about these steps that we had of discovery, design and build, hosting, and the actual use of a site. So let's go into discovery first. So this sounds kind of a bit self-serving, right? But if one thing that we're doing is if, if, if actually people is a big cost in what we're doing, then there's a then a lot of the actual steps you would typically apply, um, think about are just immediately applicable. So using greener offices, uh, using lots of virtual conferences, changing your changing your commuting habits. These are all things which, if you think about the kind of full cost of a website, you know, is actually quite uh, is actually noticeable and worth thinking about. Another thing we have is a, uh, but you we typically think of this as just kind of stuff which is just working in office is not immediately rely, uh, applicable to the discovery process. So one thing that I found useful is I've recent uh, on, on on a couple of recent projects I've been doing a lot of uh, re user research with people and fairly in depth con you know, in context research with people who live a thousand kilometers away from me in London when I'm living in Berlin. And uh, in most cases, the fact that I'm in Berlin doesn't actually come up at all. And lots of tools have become much much better to easy to work with now. So in the UK. At least having things like Hangouts available and being able to Google Hangouts is an absolute godsend. And I found Join Me probably to be the best other tool for sharing uh, screens and having conversations with people. And I've been doing things that I found some some things we found, for example, is when you have a remote research session, it's much easier to get other people on the team involved. 
So one tick, one trick we do. Two seconds. I'm just going to see what's coming through. Okay. Yeah. One thing that we've started doing uh, where I, with one client that I'm working with is we'll uh, we'll buddy up with a developer or a designer, and uh, you'll have one person uh, leading the interview, and you have the other person essentially writing things into Slack. And um, basically, writing into Slack gives us a really gives, uh, gives us a public or well, internal view of the conversation, but also gives us a load of really really handy timestamps. And the nice thing with things like Join Me now is that it's very very easy to record the video uh, of a screen share or get people to show you what they're doing, and then be able to play that with the notes and, and have the notes essentially in sync with the timestamped um, narration that you when you're using in say a Slack channel. Uh, I'm happy to talk about it in a bit more detail because we we found that really really useful when we started doing that. So there's some steps like that, and on the commuting thing, for example, there's cycling and stuff like that. But one of the reasons it's also getting easier to travel around Europe, at least. I can't speak for America because, uh, well, it's much much bigger than Europe, and uh, the train infrastructure is nowhere near as good as uh, as as Europe is. But even then, after working uh, with trains, I know that the the train situation in the UK isn't very isn't isn't great either, uh, and it's very much a kind of self. You can see the model is somewhat self-defeating for the various group for the various organisations. In fact, it was quite frustrating to work to work 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 with with that. So, I've covered a bit about discovery, uh, and I'm happy to talk about them in more detail. So, the design and build section. So, there's some common things we can do now. EcoGrader is wonderful because it basically it's made the link between. Tools like Google, like uh, Google, uh, like Wyslow and various optimizers and various uh, kind of checklists, and realize that well, the weight of your pages is, has a kind of non-zero impact on the environment. So having size budgets is one thing that EcoGrader is actually quite useful. And uh, performance is not exactly the same, but that's also another thing to uh, to that, that you can look at and you can explore in, in a lot of detail. And the nice thing is that there's loads of prior art. On uh, web performance optimization, that immediately will give you some kind of environmental kind of gain. Really, I'm not going to speak too much about color design aesthetics and everything like that because I don't want to steal James's thunder. And I got to know James through him presenting a really, really, really fun five-minute talk uh, about this. And I think there's a link elsewhere on this where you you two can see it. And yeah, that's the thing. Now, the other thing that I mentioned about with uh, is this this section here. So we spoke about EcoGrader. But that's not the only game in town. Like, uh, if there are all, also some other examples, so Green Analytics is an open source take on this that was generated by, well, put together by some people in 2010, I believe. George Zapico, and I forget the name of the other person. I'm afraid. I'm so sorry, George's friend. Uh, that's an entirely open source application that you can run yourself, uh, and uh, they share a lot of their uh, their assumptions and their working, and it actually plugs into Google Analytics, so it's using your real data. And looking at the size of your pages and the and the amount of traffic you're actually getting. Uh, the other thing that's of of some use is is the Green Web Foundation's work. So, what the the green, what they've been doing, uh, there's a little kind of widget that you can put onto a computer, um, you can install in your browser, and uh, they've been building essentially a list of every single of the kind of common providers and whether they run on coal-fired uh, power stations, so dirty power, or kind of lovely green power. And uh, this gives you a kind of hover on any single link that you look at. So by making, uh, so someone has built that into a, a little kind of handy web widget now. Uh, so you can just see that automatically, and it's a way of kind of surfing this, surfacing this. Uh, the other thing is that I spoke about it being very difficult to work out the work out the emissions of this. And uh, one thing that came out of this because a lot of these emissions and these and these assumptions tend to live in spreadsheets. So spreadsheets are great in some cases. But it's also in order for me to make the I can I could copy one of these things here, but I don't know if that's the, always the most, or it's not easy, or it would be nice if I could compo compose uh, basically, or have some kind of I think the word that's used is a model-driven debate. So I want if I, I if I want to talk about the footprint of flying, for example, I want to be able to point to a way to demonstrate those numbers in the same way that we saw with that shift in uh, in just how steep our drop of emission, emissions has to be, kind of like in here. And uh, there was a thing that made me very happy when I saw this. Uh, sorry again. Brett talks about this. He says, what if there was something like an NPM for scientific models? Now, NPM is basically a piece of JavaScript. It's a JavaScript package manager that lets you 
pull down bits of code that allow you to do ver achieve various tasks. And he's saying, well, wouldn't it be cool if there was a way that you could pull in a model for, say, residential energy and then put some numbers and get something out so you'd have one place to have this, this canonical source of truth for this? And wouldn't it be cool if you could put in some kind of model so you could have a kind of not, ju not just fact driven, you know, a model driven debate so that you can immediately try things and test them out in, uh, as, part of a, as part of your debate process rather than it just being some things living in a spreadsheet that are reliant on people having Excel or being able to open this that you could embed in all kinds of in, in all kinds of places, and I think well there is some stuff that lets you do that. So there is a when I was working at Amy, one thing we put together was a thing called uh, Amy Discover. Now Amy Discover, we were talking about the example of say lighting. This is a search engine that gives you the emission factors of various kinds of lighting. For example, so people like me, uh, things uh, these are figures that are used by existing calculators of the government when they're trying to work out these numbers themselves. And uh, you essentially have a calculator here, so you can work out these numbers here, and you can see some of the documentation which explains these ideas. And uh, the idea behind Amy, or this part of Amy, was that you could embed these these calculations anywhere, and uh, that's kind of cool. But what's really interesting, or I think quite quite exciting, was that I discovered that well, we discovered that these are these were written in JavaScript partly as just a just I think it's because it was the, the easiest thing to use with scientists at the time. And that's exciting because a few years ago, Amy released all of the data sets for, all of their, for almost all of their calculations. So you can look at this website here, and you can see these numbers to work out, say, the footprint per person uh, or the CO2 emissions per, per, per person uh, per, uh, over a distance for a particular kind of car. And uh, this stuff is all now open for, that could be reused by anyone. And these are numbers which, these, these, these figures here, which are on GitHub, you can see, these give you some. These essentially give you the raw data and the raw numbers that you would use to work out these these footprints, the, 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 these numbers, and that's kind of cool because you've got things which exist as JavaScript, which could be embedded anywhere, and then you've got things like um, notebooks now. And notebooks are an interesting piece of technology because you can think of them as a kind of they are a tool that lets you to have some kind of What's the best way? A, narr a kind of kind of sci a, a narrative for your a technical narrative. So you might talk about uh, uh, some. So you 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 might actually talk about uh, a project, or you might say try to explore something, and you can basically share show your working as you work through this. And uh, you'll see lots and lots of these used by data scientists now to uh, share ideas. So I would really just recommend just opening up. Just Google kind of Jupyter data science, and then you'll see some really interesting examples of people walking through some changes, uh, some some uh, some analysis, and sharing the steps as they were, so they can show they're working to have this kind of model-driven debate. And uh, actually, BuzzFeed are one of the good people who do, uh, are actually doing this very very well uh, when they when when they do their own kind of expose exposés now. So you can kind of see that if you were able to kind of have some open source stuff here. And you could in, install some of this, and you have the chance to have some kind of shareable, model-driven debate, which we could start working towards. If these numbers were as easy to update as things are on GitHub by by people, then you've got something which is, you know, potentially quite exciting. Because one of the problems we had with, when we were building Amy is that we were limited by the team of, uh, well, how big our own scientific team could be. But if you had something where you could allow anyone to fork and change a model, then you can keep these up to date, and you can have. Conversations that are backed by, you know, solid methodology uh, with some real numbers, rather than me chucking in something into us, uh, then us putting things into a spreadsheet. We're not always sure if this is the best source, for example. So that's kind of exciting, and I think there's something in there. So I'm gonna zoom out now to look what we we have there. So that should hopefully give us some idea of working out the footprint and being able to kind of measure what we have if we want to manage it now. So. I said a bit about the cloud and what's happening with hosting and what steps you can take or things you can apply. Now, in the conversation in uh, Slack, some people were talking about WordPress and Drupal and things like this, and these are important things to take into account uh, because WordPress is powering something like 20% of the internet now, and generally that many services has a non-zero impact on, 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 on the environment, really. So the nice thing is that, again, there are things that you can do to help with that. Now, I'm going to browse through this pretty quickly because there's a lot. Because I, I don't, I don't want to go over time, and I and I promise James I'd be I try and 
stick to the time here. So PHP Hip Hop, Hip Hop is a project which uh, Facebook have released, which basically essentially brings something like double the performance out of existing uh, PHP uh, programs by compiling these down. Now it's not always totally, uh, it's not always configurable and not always compatible, but essentially if, you, if you're working with a PHP application, then it'll be worth, uh, it's worth looking into some of these compilers and see if you might get some performance improvements from there, because if you're using fewer servers, then you know, you're, you're having a win here. Now there's a number of new pro programming languages like Go, which is released by Google, which is again like a, it's designed to be an easier to use version of something like C, which is very very fast and easier to maintain than these kind of projects, and generally a bit more safe to work with. Likewise, you're seeing the kind of programming languages that get people ex that tend to attract uh, developers like Ruby and Python. You're things you're seeing thing you're seeing a lot of these ideas in uh, languages that run on the Java virtual machine now because it's basically so fast and so and it's very very stable. So Clojure and Scala are, are examples of this. So we've covered you know I've, I've given you a few pointers in basically making the servers run faster. Another thing is well maybe if you don't actually need to have servers at all, what if you could just have having something dynamically serving requests? You could just have a way to just put static files online. So you'll see lots of static site generators these days which do this. So the two big ones are Jekyll and Hugo, and those are these are the tools which are increasingly powering lots of the kind of GitHub pages style things where you'll make some changes on GitHub and it will directly put together a lovely looking website. If GitHub had renewable power, run on renewable power, it would be absolutely wondrous. But sadly, they tend to be running in Rackspace in coals and in coal country. So it's I don't think they have a particularly green footprint. And uh, the next thing after having service is, well, what if you didn't need to make a request at all? So CDNs, which are content dis delivery networks, are these kinds of things. So in many cases, and uh, if you're, for example, most browsers are smart enough not to try and download jQuery, uh, the same version of jQuery uh, on various servers. And uh, rather than downloading it from lots and lots of different places, it's easier if you can just get it from the closest server to you. So fewer hops, making me fewer hops along the network. I mean, there is there is fewer. Well, yeah, you basically don't need to kind of shunt data across so many computers for it to get to your computer. And uh, Cloudflare is probably an example of doing something like this. So Cloudflare are a free service, and uh, they give you basically a nice fast. Uh, they they will cache a lot of your requests so that if your cache is if your if your yours is the same as a previous one, it will just serve that rather than hitting your server. Now Google are doing the same thing now, but they are doing it in a way which is quite interesting in that you can't essentially get it for free when you put stuff on, uh, when, when you use Google's networks now. So the idea is that you don't need to think too much about this yourself. And I've linked to this for people to explore in a bit more detail. It's still kind of alpha, but it has the nice advantage of being Google stuff, which generally is extremely clean, and uh, a CDN, which, you could, which should work with a lot of things that you have. Netflix are doing some interesting uh, work in this area as well. So Netflix is a huge, well, basically, user of uh, the interwebs, and in particular, Amazon uh, AWS. And uh, they, they're they actually probably one of the exem ex exemplar companies for environment, for responsible environmental use of responsible, responsible delivery of services in a way that is kind of, I guess, sympathetic to the environment. So they've open sourced and shared a lot of their, their designs for essentially these kinds of caching along the network. And I'm just, well, I've got to run short on time. Bear me for a second. I'm just going to open up to see what we have. How are we doing for time here? I've got, I think I'm actually kind of done here. I think I think we're, we're running short on time, actually. So there's a lot more that I can, I can tell you about. Uh, James, do I have not, can you let me know if I have, do I need to wind up now? Because I have so much more to go to, to run through. And uh, I might, it might be better for me to just save this left until later, because there's some really, really cool stuff. And there's some more, some more, some of the information about how you can find out the footprint of your own provider uh, if they release things to the Carbon Disclosure Project, like Salesforce, for example. This example here is Amazon, who they do lots of good things, but they don't share any information. So you just have to trust that they're green. And uh, that can be problematic, problematic at times. I'm just going to wind up here, because there's loads here, and I don't want to uh, jeopardize the next speaker.